So hello, and welcome to It's Raining Modules, a talk about distributing PowerShell modules sensibly that I just had to remove the word hallelujah from the first slide because I forgot that I'd left that in there. In this session, you're going to learn briefly about PowerShell modules and why you might not want to publish your modules, modules and scripts publicly, how you can distribute them, uh, both publicly and privately, some best practices for module distribution. We're going to cover distribution via a wide variety of popular methods, along with a few outliers, although in fairly high level uh, stuff and dive into some gotchas for some of the fun ones. There'll be a few sort of small micro demos throughout and there'll be a section at the end for questions. So before we start, who am I and why did I want to talk about this? Uh, I'm James Ruskin. Uh, I'm from the United Kingdom and you may have seen me near the Chocolatey booth. I currently work at Chocolatey Software as a solutions engineer uh, where we're trying to help folk distribute packages in various fun and awesome ways. Since I joined, I seem to have spent a lot of time thinking about NuGet feeds in some form or another. And I've previously been a DevOps engineer, a sysadmin, and a happy-go-lucky help desk uh, operative of some kind. So the one thing I wanted to do in just about all of those jobs is to write PowerShell and then share it with various different systems and people. As a DevOps engineer, I wrote questionably useful functions that improve the team's development experience and helped maintain larger, more official modules full of useful functions that were shipped to build pipelines, jump boxes, and the machines and deployed products. It's worth noting that the requirements for those two types of modules differ. For instance, the requirement for having change approvals, uh, changes approved, tested, and then uh, merged, the same benefits apply for both when you're talking about distributing them. Uh, so in both cases, we want to kind of enable everything to use a common version and update them when appropriate. But we'll come back to that in a second. As, <laughs> sorry, as a sysadmin, I wrote scripts that were slowly refactored to become functions in modules to help do things like create and maintain user accounts, to help script setup of servers, and to help other PowerShell fearing folk on the team have an easier entry point to tasks that I knew would actually do the things that we wanted them to do. Finally, uh, or first up, as a help desk chap, I wrote stuff to save me time on the ticket queue and then stored it in some very questionable ways. Uh, at the time, I didn't have much care for any of the things we're going to talk about today, but um, I'm hoping I've improved since. It's possible that this mostly just says that I got better at describing what I did in pretty words um, as I went on, but uh, at the end of the day, I hope that this just shows that I loved writing and distributing PowerShell stuff uh, to various people. Uh, and I'm sure we all appreciate that doing this through monolithic PS1 files via Slack, Teams, etc., not the right move. But we'll kind of leave some of that for somebody else to talk about. So, I suspect just about everyone here knows what a PowerShell module is. Um, but let's quickly run through a brief and mildly biased summary so that I can set up the exposition for the rest of the talk. So at a very basic level, a module is a group of hopefully related scripts slash functions along with any associated binaries, libraries, or data to make that work. Modules can be easily installed or loaded in about one line, um, and they make it easier to version these groups of independent features and functions and to provide documentation for them appropriately. And they're kind of easy to distribute. Um, <laughs> and, or at least, there are lots of ways to do it. Um, some easier than others. As it happens, that is what we're here to talk about, so let's go for that. So from the perspectives we care about, uh, as in we're not going into modules in memory or anything like that, PowerShell modules are likely to be a PSD1 file, uh, defining some metadata for the module in question, and depending on your approach to building and compiling modules, uh, or not, uh, one or more files containing scripts, or compiled functions, or useful libraries, and of course, potentially, a smattering of associated format files or data files, help files, and more. So you can have a bunch of those files to be stored somewhere uh, on your machine in order to make that module available from something pretty busy looking like this um, to something very compact and easy to grok, and just about everything in between. So three separate examples of modules there. Um, sadly, very zoomed up. I apologize for that. Happily, for just about every method of distribution that we're talking about here, that we're actually going to recommend, it all gets packaged away into an archive, leading to an easier time distributing, versioning, et cetera. Um, so that just goes into <laughs> um, an NUPKG. Um, but that's essentially a zip file, which is very helpful because Font Awesome did not have an NUPKG SVG. So I'm sorry about that. 
Uh, these NewPeg files can be shipped around the place easily and uh, are frequently uploaded to a NuGet feed on, for example, the PowerShell gallery, um, which I'm sure, again, everyone is very familiar with, um, either by visiting it specifically to find a module or directed there by a search engine in order to figure out what a given function is in. Uh, it's a fantastic resource for PowerShell modules in general, and it's a great place to grab and update public modules from, with an emphasis on public. Assuming you've gone through a few setup steps, installing a module can be really simple. You can install it. I'm sure there's briefly nothing up my sleeves. And then we can import it. Though again, we're coming back to the roughly in one line part of that because there are some initial setup steps that were performed behind the curtains here. But yeah, if it's so easy to use the gallery, why do we actually care about how we distribute our awesome modules? Happily, this is some of the stuff that I deal with day to day with package management. Um, and the reason that we at Chocolatey, where I currently work, um, suggests that folk generally host their own internal secured repositories for packages. First up, you might consider that even though we're following good practices and presumably not embedding actual secrets into our code, your security hat or department may not appreciate laying out, for example, the exact steps that you use to configure and deploy your infrastructure. Similarly, by uh, controlling hosting yourself and not putting it exclusively anywhere that may have downtime that you don't control or expect, um, you can ensure that your build pipelines consistently succeed and folk can always get the update they need or however you want to view that. Finally, it may not be a good thing to push every possible thing to a public location. Jokingly speaking, you might just be adding clutter and load to a public resource that is otherwise overloaded. Something to think about. If you are concerned about any of these things, uh, you may want to consider publishing your private PowerShell modules to a private repository instead of any of these, pu instead of publicly. For instance, the PS Gallery. There are many different private repository solutions available, such as Azure Artifacts, GitHub Packages, Nexus, and many, many more. So let's a fair few, I'll sort of class these into various different types of distributions. So you've got publicly available sites, such as the PowerShell Gallery, GitHub Packages, and the GitLab Registry. You've got publicly available sites that you'll optionally be able to secure it by possibly paying. So similar stuff, you've got the Azure DevOps Artifact Feeds, CloudSmith, um, the GitLab and Hub uh, have paid options, but they're both actually free, as we'll come to. And if this is starting to sound like a Peter von Seraphonic sketch, then I apologize. Um, and again, we'll go on to options that you'll need to spin up a server or service for. So we've got Cenotype Nexus, we have Artifactory and Baguette, and some wildcards. So again, slight bias here. You can use Chocolatey to distribute PowerShell modules. You can quite literally pop them on a network share. Uh, and you can actually then use uh, services such as Cloudflare's Zero Trust, um, or anything where you're controlling authentication in another method to take an unauthenticated NuGet feed and use that. Uh, we'll run through a few of these just quickly, highlighting some advantages and disadvantages as we go. Um, so to start off, PowerShell Gallery, superbly available to a problem, problematic extent almost. It's extremely accessible, but there's no way to actually lock that down. Uh, it's been known in the past to have some periods of flakiness, but it's otherwise a superb resource. Adding to the fantastic availability, it's the literal default installation method for pretty much any install, install of PowerShell, although it's untrusted by default, so. Uh, using the GitHub Packages feed seems like an excellent choice then if you want to secure your stuff. Uh, it actually does allow for public and private feeds, which is good. However, and this is gonna be a bit of a running theme in the upcoming um, evaluations, if you will, um, it requires that you use a PowerShell get pre-release version because it only supports NuGet v3 currently. And similarly, and this may not be a problem for smaller modules where you haven't written any dependencies in, you're gonna to need to ensure that any dependent modules are actually uploaded to that feed before you can install from it. Uh, GitLab offers a very similar proposition. Uh, it's available with public and private feeds, but it only supports v3 and <laughs> Just very similar, sorry. DevOps, uh, Azure DevOps Artifacts actually shares some properties with the above. Uh, you can 
have public and private feeds. But it's actually got a few issues which were the original motivation for me trying to put this talk together. Um, simply speaking, you require an Azure Artifacts credential provider to do any advanced operations. For example, if you wanted to push to the feed, um, you're going to need to install an additional thing to do so. For install, upgrade, etc., same deal. Um, so for that, you've got a new and interesting challenge where you'll have to go into that. Um, it does, however, support NuGet v2 and v3. So you have that. CloudSmith is a cloud-based service that allows you to host a variety of repositories. They've got excellent handling for authentication with both v2 and v3, as it happens. Uh, they have the ability to filter down available modules into based on the authenticated user or group. Um, even if you just use a single repository for all your users, you can provide access to only certain modules for this. But they are an exclusively cloud-based service, and unsurprisingly, there is a cost for using them. So moving over to things you actually have to host yourself, we've got Zimtac Nexus, um, and similarly, Artifactory, but that's nothing here. Um, this is super easy to deploy. You've got a lot of different options uh, to do so, and it supports interesting, fun things like grouping a proxy feed, and allow it, which allows you to cache packages from an existing repository online, for example, PowerShell Gallery, um, with internal feeds. And that solves the issue with dependencies that we mentioned earlier. On top of that, it's got excellent support for authentication and supports both NuGet v2 and v3. Uh, though with some mild caveats that we'll find. Packet is a delight of a miniature NuGet server. Again, you can spin it up using just about anything. Um, you can run it via a proxy, uh, sorry, as a proxy, using, so again, mirroring what you have in PowerShell Gallery based on what you call, um, and that will give you a very lightweight caching server for large NuGet repositories online. However, it doesn't actually support authenticated downloads or installs, so you would need to add in something else, for example, um, a proxy or Cloudflare Zero Trust, to enable that to be authenticated within certain definitions, or host it within the boundaries of your infrastructure. Showing that bias that I mentioned earlier, <laughs> um, it's actually a surprisingly fun tool to use for installing PowerShell modules, as you don't need to worry about fixing up the various providers to use it. So assuming that you're uh, using PowerShell GET or similar, um, you are able to deal with module installation here without actually um, ensuring that you've installed the NuGet provider or anything similar, because you can just write PowerShell scripts to do it. The downside there is that you need to write PowerShell scripts to do it. We do have a PowerShell module template or two, but that's um, more work than none. It does currently require a v2 feed, but v3 support's coming soon, and we can use it to provide additional configuration. So just to go back to that, because I did mention that um, PowerShell get and is potentially an issue, we've already mentioned that it's problematic in that you have to run a beta version to use NuGet v3. So, you know, why, why else might we want to ignore that um, in the previous slide? It's, it's simply because the older version that is available in Windows by default is really quite old. Um, similar to Pesta, it's quite unlikely to be updated, or so I hear. And you're actually missing features uh, such as support for pre-release versions in the version that is installed. Uh, and of course, that's still in beta, um, and has been for a significant amount of time. I don't know if there is a roadmap for that being released. So to run on to some uh, better practice, oh well, sorry, some, some gotchas when installing stuff, particularly when installing using uh, unattended build agents and the like. Um, if you ever tried to install a module on a fresh VM build agent or something similar, you'll probably have come across the NuGet provider not having been installed yet. This, going back to the last slide, is well, literally the, the issue that you're looking for. Um, if you want to use this on a custom build agent, you'll probably need to ensure that you have uh, an install script of some kind that will actually ensure that this is there, which is simple enough, and I have an example. Um, but that will allow you to have uh, an item potent build, essentially, where it will actually work every time, even if you haven't run it first time. So if you're using clean build agents or ephemeral build agents, then you're not going to have an issue. 
somewhat dipping into other folks' talks on best practices for module creation. But first, if you are looking for good practices for module distribution, I would suggest making sure that, similar to when writing a function, you should separate, you should make sure that a module has a single given concern, um, a specific purpose. So not saying I didn't have a catch-all module at one point, Lynn, similar to James's little helpers, but particularly if you're bundling a lot of different resources in there, not having to load everything for every instance is gonna be useful. An example of this could be the AZ modules, where each individual module has a specific domain to address and uses dependencies in order to ensure that it's got everything it needs. AZ accounts versus AZ VMs is, that there's a requirement there. And if you don't have to load the other 35,000 modules in that, you shouldn't. There's little sense in having a module loaded by help desk containing functions used by the build pipelines or vice versa. Particularly if you're gonna be doing that, you should use, you, you should add useful metadata to your module, including I would suggest uh, using Semver or something similar to indicate breaking changes. This will allow you to use strict dependencies to ensure that you don't break downstream modules if you do have dependencies. And if you add comment-based help to each of the functions within the module, your help will be distributed with uh, that module uh, and match the loaded version so you'll be able to discover things more easily there. Uh, similarly, you'll be able to use Platypus or something like that to generate versioned help and store that on a local static site. Or something like that. Um, finally, and this is a bit of a silly one, but I would recommend automating the distribution of your module, which I'm sure everyone would do, um, but only doing so after you're actually happy to release it. Right, yes, sorry. I did disable my demo slide because I thought I would ask if anybody had any questions and then we could demo those questions. So, does anybody have any questions? Yeah? Uh, so the question was, uh, there are many other providers other than, um, sorry, please correct me if I'm getting this wrong, uh, but there are many other providers other than the PowerShell Get and uh, Packet Manager providers used to, um, that can be used to distribute modules. Do I have opinions on those? Uh, so, uh, for example, using NuGet is, is what the, the response there was. Um, yes, those are all valid options. There are some, I think, dis again, you'd need to uh, implement additional functionality around that in scripts to, to use it. Um, but, yeah, it, it would work and it would be good, certainly. Um, so the question was, uh, would I ever consider signing my code when pushing it to the PowerShell gallery or some similar public uh, thing? Uh, yeah, absolutely, particularly when um, you are interested in providing people with assurance that it is your code that they are running. Um, obviously, a code signing certificate is reasonably expensive. Um, there are certain, there is a new provider coming around similar to Let's Encrypt but for code signing certificates, but that I think is not uh, available yet. Um, but yeah, it, it's, it's a good thing, particularly if you want to uh, provide security that people are running your code. So to briefly summarize that for viewers at home, um, code signing certificates are less expensive than I expected at around 40 bucks for Komodo. Um, it won't get you past uh, signing policies, um, execution policies, sorry. Um, and it may not be worth doing except for as a basic attestation. Of... Sure, so um, the question there was, is there a point where I would suggest moving away from single PSM1 files within a module and going to multiple split out modules? Um, I think that's, uh, I guess there's two bits to that. Um, first up, it rather depends on how you want to build your module. Uh, I'm a big fan of compiling, yeah, multiple separate uh, PS1 files within source into a single PSM1 file. Um, that's for a couple of different reasons. Um, firstly, there is a mild performance benefit if you're signing your code, um, as it happens when you're importing. It is mild, but it's there. Um, and secondly, sort of find it tidier. Um, sorry, uh, it's, yeah, there is, there is mild performance benefits for it when loading uh, single files versus uh, if you have, you know, some logic in a PSM1 file that goes and gets child item of all the things in a folder um, and then tries to import or dot source all of those within the module. Um, It, it, it also feels like if you're not signing your code, then that would allow you to be exploited slightly. If somebody dropped a new file into one of those folders and you hadn't explicitly said that I would like to only import these things, but of course if you're not signing your code, then that wouldn't actually help. 
um, because they would just be able to insert a new file in there. So. I, I think I would generally compile it anyway. <laughs> Uh, I mean, Justin, if you do you want to rebut? So, like, my I was just trying to figure out how to summarize it a little. Um, a summary of that response, I guess, is that with the tools available to us now, um, personally, I'm a fan of Module Builder, for example, which does just compile things from public private folders. Um, but yeah, the, with with the tooling available now, it's much easier to be able to. Um, you know, get get around all the problems that we're, try, we're trying to be addressed by having things split up. So, um, okay, fantastic. Then I really did come in way under. Uh, so in summary, um, sharing your PowerShell is a great thing. Uh, sharing it as a well-formatted module improves that hugely, but you should possibly consider that you don't want to share it with everybody. So consider where you actually want to publish it, and there may be a more appropriate answer than everywhere. You should consider providing useful metadata with your module, including indicating if your changes will break compatibility with anything else. Uh, and you should probably upgrade your module providers if you actually want to use them, and or if you want to try and use uh, NuGet v3 in the near future. Um, so with that, uh, if you want to chat about any other stuff, please come find me at the Chocolatey booth um, at the high rolling happy hour later today, or throughout the week, or online. Um, over there. Uh, and mild <laughs> updates there. <laughs> So thank you very much for your time. Have a great time at Summit. See you all around. <laughs>